Myron Roll is was one of the biggest studs in the country when it came to football. Went to Florida State inexplicably. You should have been a Virginia Cavalier. I don't know what happened there. Uh, we would have loved to have you up north, but it all worked out. Oxford for a year, the Titans for three years, drafted uh, and decided he wanted to walk away and become a doctor. And I'm glad that, uh, you know, if you're going to be cutting into my brain, that you're going to be having to study for seven years. That seems long enough to me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Um, so right now, uh, before we get into the obvious stuff, you're on the front line battling um, COVID. Your, your floor at Mass General has uh, turned into a surge clinic uh, and you volunteered to work it. Um, and you guys have 1,200 cases as of yesterday of COVID, which is wild. Um, I do want to plug your your foundation uh, because I think it's great work you're doing. Uh, reading right off the site because I don't want to butcher anything. It's dedicated to supporting wellness, educational, and other charitable initiatives throughout the world that benefit children and families in need. And you started this thing in 2009. What are you guys doing uh, as we speak? I know things are probably on hold with uh, with COVID a little bit. Yeah, no, thanks for, for talking. But yeah, absolutely, man. Our foundation, it means a lot to me. Uh, the Myron L. Roll Foundation, um, you know, we help children, especially disenfranchised and marginalized kids uh, in America and even back home in the Bahamas, too, where I'm originally from. Uh, I've always had a heart for service. Uh, my favorite Bible verse comes from Matthew 25, 40. Jesus talking to his disciples, inasmuch as ye have done for the least of these, my brethren, ye have done unto me. So the least of these is the type of people that I, we try to affect change in. So we run this academy, this wellness and leadership academy for foster kids in Florida and in the Bahamas. Uh, we do something called uh, Rose to Success, a playoff of the Rose Scholarship, sort of an academic workshop for these kids and get them thinking better as, as sort of students and how to figure out this game of academia and, and work through that, that, that road. So it's something that we've, uh, we've, we've, we've loved uh, every year. We work at it and um, it's been consistent since 2009. Uh, still doing it now. We're looking to expand here in Boston because I'm here for seven years. So uh, it's been great. And it's one of my highlights of my year. Whenever we get to see these kids come out of the situation where they thought they didn't have a chance, they didn't have any future. And now they at least see an opportunity for them. Uh, and if we can provide that for them, it's amazing. I think that's wonderful, man. And I know it's got to be tough right now. I mean, I run a foundation of my own and, and uh, you know, People are that that sort of thing might take a backseat for a little while, but I think uh, I think it's all hands on deck here domestically to support our communities and the things that people are going through. So you're really fighting battles on on multiple fronts now, and I applaud you for that. So I appreciate you. And uh, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, you are uh, on the front line. You're do about to do a 24 hour shift right now. Is that your first? Yeah, so uh, I've done 24 hour shifts on Friday and Sunday. I have another one tomorrow. So. This, um, you know, our hospital has been transformed, Chris. I mean, we, when you walk in now, it doesn't look like Mass General anymore. It's a Harvard hospital, very big, a thousand beds in our hospital. We're a major transfer center for New England, Vermont, Maine, uh, across the country, even internationally. We get patients from Bahrain or the UAE. And so um, to see our hospital now where everyone has to wear a face mask, everyone gets hand sanitizer as soon as you walk in the hospital, um, the clinics aren't open anymore. Everything is done virtually now to keep people away from the hospital because it is sort of a nidus of infection right now. The emergency department is overflowing with people who are coming in off the street with symptoms analogous to COVID-19 or positive tests. Um, our neurosurgical floor, as you mentioned, has been transformed. Our operating rooms are slowing down. I did an operation today, but I think by next week, you know, we're going to stop any elective cases and just have these operating rooms be available for potential ICUs. We've even transferred our pediatric ICU patients from our hospital to the local children's hospital so that the pediatric ICU now can become an adult ICU for more bed space so that just the hospital is just sort of energy, focus, resources, all on COVID-19. And for neurosurgeons like us, you know, we're just trying to adapt and adjust now. We're not doing brain tumors and spine surgery anymore. We're trying to take care of these patients uh, who have COVID-19 because their respiratory issues are amazing. And it's really impressive. Uh, and you just have to really work quickly, get the right scans, get the right consults in order, and try to save them as best you can. Because when it does hit, and it hits severely, uh, these people decompensate very quickly. Yeah, and and you know this has become kind of a well, especially initially there was a, there were a population of people downplaying it as the flu, um, not understanding 
you know, that this is a novel virus. So even if it were like the flu, from what I understand, that would still be a really bad deal. And I'll let you kind of uh, weigh in on the differences in, in the flu and, and, and COVID, but you're a, you're, you're going to be a nerd, a neurosurgeon. I mean, this isn't an, you're, you don't deal in the world of upper respiratory stuff on the regular, but you and a lot of other doctors from different you know, um, vocations uh, under the, the medical umbrella have rushed to the scene to help out. Now, that means that there's probably a learning curve, right? A little bit of one. And then also that, as you mentioned, a lot of elective surgeries are being canceled. So one, how big was that learning curve? And then two, you know, mentioning, you know, you did maybe your last neurosurgery uh, recently. Are there any elective surgeries that that not getting them can be life threatening? Who's who's getting hit the hardest? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the learning curve, first question, is is very steep. And thankfully, we've had some med- medical attendings and medical doctors who are great teachers. And to be at Harvard at this hospital, it is a teaching hospital. So sort of education is required, or at least assumed, to be a part of your role of treating patients. You treat patients, and you also teach, and so. They've had to teach, you know, OB guys, neurosurgeons like us, dermatologists, anyone who typically doesn't deal with these upper respiratory viral illnesses, uh, what to do. And uh, they've given us modules to look at, and they've given us some sort of a, a steep, you know, sort of um, um, uh, reading and literature, some up-to-date literature, some journal articles to just kind of dive into and kind of get ready. Uh, they make sure that we're not doing anything that's out of our... Um, our scope of practice. You know, we're not going to go and intubate a person. I mean, we know how to take off of the skull and take out a brain tumor, but, you know, we're not intubating everyone in the operating room. We have anesthesiologists for that. But if we need to put in orders, if we need to get a chest x-ray, if we need to draw labs, these are things that we can do. I know how to do these things. We are medical doctors first before we subspecialize into neurosurgeons. So absolutely great question, but the learning curve is steep. We have great people to kind of help. As for those cases that have been postponed or canceled, you know, it's hard when you think about a neurosurgery case being elected, right? Somebody's right. got a benign brain tumor, and I mean, I'm sure you probably want that out, and you don't want to keep waiting with this thing in your head like, oh, man, you know, when is this going to grow? Is this going to cause a seizure? Is this going to turn from being an elective case to an urgent emerging case? And we know, Chris, that evidence has shown us that if we uh, take urgent and emerging cases and the outcomes, the patient outcomes after those cases, they don't do as well as the elective cases. What's the reason for that? Well, elective cases are controlled, they're slow, they're optimized, you have all the right labs, the right personnel, you got the right equipment, everything is just in order. It just, it moves with a better rhythm and pace. Urgent, emergent, it's like um, fast and furious. It's just like, go, 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 get it done. You can miss a step, you can lose blood that you're not supposed to lose, you can have the wrong equipment in there, you might not have the staff that's capable of kind of managing that situation. So these patients, unfortunately, don't do as well. So it's a great question. I think right now we're trying to, as best we can, parse out the patients who need those elective surgeries. Like, for instance, the case I did this morning was a guy with you know, a, a brain tumor that was pretty serious and, and stage well uh, advanced, um, and he needed this. Um, yeah. But for those ones who are maybe you know, lower stages or smaller or asymptomatic um, and younger, you know, we take in all these factors, we might tell them, hey, right now the hospital is a nidus for infection. It's not a great place to be. And we're slowing our resources down so that we can redirect them to the COVID-19. People have to be scared when they hear that. Yeah, they're very scared. And it's been hard, especially the, uh, the older population, because one, they, you know, have been dealing with their issue. Say a person's got a spine herniation, a, a disc herniation, and they can't walk. Uh, and their walking is getting worse. It's a real pain that they're feeling and they're expecting to get it treated by us, um, it becomes a problem and is a tough, tough decision to make. But it's one, ultimately, after you explain the situation, give them the facts, give them the fact that, you know, if you were to come in here as a 76-year-old person with a chronic disc in your back, you may leave, unfortunately, infected with COVID-19. That's how bad it is right now. Right. It's riskier for you to come in and get the surgery. No question. No question. And so... In saying that, I think the patients are sort of getting an understanding, but certainly it's not an easy thing to go through and it's a hard conversation for sure. At, at what point did you know watching the news um, or following this thing, tracking it since early this year? Um, I can remember a moment when I was in Africa for Waterboys, my initiative, mm-hmm. and I was worried, A, 
when I saw that it was spreading in Italy, that we were going to have a real problem here and B that like, I might not even be able to get back home. I made it back in late February, but a few weeks later, it could have been a lot more complicated. Um, was there a time as, um, as a doctor where you're saying I might be called to the front lines in this fight? Um, and, and it, was there a moment where you realized it was going to get this bad? Did you ever see it getting this bad? I did not see it getting this bad. I mean, I knew about two or three weeks ago when our hospital started to make some adjustments, they didn't let us fly to any conferences anymore. And uh, they were kind of reducing the number of patients, families that were able to come and visit them. When they started making these adjustments hospital-wide, I said, ooh, this might be serious. And they may be hearing some of the stats that are coming um, from epidemiologists and other you know, um, trackers who say, okay, well, this is how many number of infected patients Boston is going to see in the next week or two weeks or three weeks. When they started to make these changes, I said, well, we're a big hospital with a lot of resources. And if we're making this adjustment, then I can only imagine what the suburban local community hospitals are doing. And so we need to take this seriously. And it wasn't until about a week or two ago that our department started to make the more micro and minute adjustments to our daily schedule to let us know that, yeah, this is real, all hands on deck. Doesn't matter if you're being redeployed to the ICU, to the emergency department, to the surge clinic, you're gonna have a role here because we all need to be in this fight together. And define surge clinic because that's what your floor has become. Yeah, so the surge clinic is basically a hospital within a hospital that sees patients that come from the street with COVID-19 or maybe symptoms analogous to COVID-19 and is run by uh, medical doctors and infectious disease doctors. And we welcome them with open arms, come in and act as scribes, write notes, take histories, put oxygen on, on people if they need it, uh, get the proper labs, draw those labs, triage them and manage them through the hospital. If they need to come into the hospital, get them to the right floor. If they don't, then you make sure that they go self-quarantine and you uh, arrange the proper and necessary follow-up for them after. So it's a um, it's sort of a, just a, a, you know, a drive-through clinic that our hospital is doing um, in the midst of handling all these very acute cases. When you show up to that surge clinic, Where's your, where's your head at? Are you, are you, are you afraid? Are you gotta be afraid? I'm, I'm, I say I'm nervous uh, a little bit, but I think I'm more nervous for the patients because I know where, where this can lead. I've walked into the emergency department from having a consult that's, you know, they call me say, Hey, Myron, there's a neurosurgical patient down here. They've got a brain bleed. They were on a blood thinner and um, they're 90 years old. And I walk past that room, and in the next room, I see somebody get emergently or urgently intubated because they have COVID-19, and then their family being called because they're having end-of-life or goals of care discussions. That is the, the extreme. That's the end line of this thing. This is where these patients can go. They can go from talking to you and me on a day-to-day -day basis, enjoying their life, drinking water, doing everything that they've been doing, and the next second, having to have a tube down their throat, and their family being called and saying, well if this patient was outside of their body and seeing how they looked right now with a tube down their mouth, uh, would they want to be in this state? And so these are very challenging conversations to have. And I'm nervous for those patients who come off the street with this because I know it can get there. And so, but my, my role, just like any of my colleagues role is just, you know, to kind of help um, manage them and get them the right consults and get them to write labs and get them to the right floor so they're managed appropriately. It sounds like this, obviously there's a number of differences. Um between this and other illnesses that we, we, we've had to deal with that we're more familiar with, but one being that there's no roadmap and you do hear stories. I mean, talking about the British prime minister who you would assume has the best in healthcare. He's probably relatively healthy. Um, he's not elderly. Uh, he's older, but I can remember seeing him Skype into, you know, a press conference looking healthy one day after his diagnosis. And then you know, he's, he's, he's hanging out at home and within 24 hours, he's in ICU. And I, these turns happen quickly. Have you heard stories of extreme turns like you're talking about that, that stick in your head? So, yeah, I mean, just, you know, that, that story was a real story um, that I had mentioned about the emergent and urgent intubation. And those are never ones that you want to go through either. I've seen patients be turned prone. Uh, because sometimes it's it's easier to, to expand your lungs and to breathe better when you're turned on your belly rather than supine on your back. These are things that are happening quite often. Typically, they would happen maybe once or twice a day, but now it's happening eight to nine, ten times in these ICUs where these um, you know respiratory illness is just really taking a hold of, of these individuals. And I think 
these stories of the prime minister from the UK, of Chris Cuomo from CNN, of you know other celebrities or people who have a platform to speak to people who may not see a hospital or understand what's happening in a hospital, I think these stories are making it more real for people, or at least I hope it is. Because for a long time, I think people were doubting that this was A, happening, and B, that it should matter to either one of us. Um, these were just numbers, right? 5,000 people die in the UK, 10,000 in America. Uh, they just seem like stats and figures. But when you think about it, these are real people with real lives, real stories, with real families who are being affected by this as well. And you don't want that to be you or anyone you love. So do your part. And we've all talked about the part that the normal citizenry and the demos can do social distancing, physical distancing, stay at home, healthy lifestyle, lifestyle behavior modifications, wear a mask if you're going outside, these sorts of things, because everyone's got a role. We do it in healthcare, but everyone in their normal life can, can do it as well. Well, you make a good point. It's, it, it was relatively faceless, and you could write off a lot of the statistics as, and, and that may be true, and I'll let, you, I'll let you weigh in on that, but you know, we, we could all look at the statistics and say, well, most people have pre-existing conditions or are elderly, but you can't deny that there are a number of anecdotal stories right now coming from younger patients who seemingly are very healthy, who either die or get very, very sick. And to your point, like having folks who are celebrities or people who are visual, like they're, they're available, whether it's like, you know, Chris Cuomo's going on the news, he's describing his symptoms, he's there every day from his basement. Um, you know, a, a politician. I mean, that's somebody that you would assume has the best of the best in healthcare. And, um, you know, that I think it helps see people to see that A, you can get very sick, um, and B, you can get better too. So, I mean, like, take it seriously. But um, I had a, a producer, I did a show in the fall for uh, NFL Network, and he's 42 years old. He ended up in ICU. He wasn't, um, he wasn't uh, hooked up to a breathing machine, but he, he did have oxygen and he was out and he's still sick two weeks later, just, just knocked down, can't get it. So I think that those sort of anecdotal stories ha uh, help a lot. When you, when you talk about this disease and the end of the road scenario that you mentioned earlier, which is a, a fast turn or, um, you know, for the worse, how do people die from this? I mean, like what kills these people, you know, in their final moments, what is happening to your body? Because I don't see that graphically described very often either. You lose the ability to, to do the things that um, make us live on a day-to-day -day basis, give us the exams that we have, give us the ability to function, move our arms, breathe, see, um, do all the senses that, um, that we typically have uh, available to us. And so without oxygenation, without the ability to sort of um, have the normal functioning of these organs, uh, you, be, you succumb to this. and. It's, it's, a real, it's a real problem. And no matter how much oxygen you have, no matter how much respiratory support you can get, sometimes it's too grave, especially if you have these pre-existing conditions where your immune system is sort of fighting and battling your AFib or your chronic diabetes or your hypertension or your AIDS or your endogenous steroid use or something like that, you know, just, uh, or exogenous steroid use. It's just your immune system is sort of fighting this other battle when you have this other disease that's coming around the back and saying, okay, we're gonna take you out this way. So it's, um, it's very difficult. And could they be, they could be truly underlying conditions, like not just things that you knew you had been diagnosed with, but something you didn't know you had. And this, this virus brings it out. Oh yeah. Or worsens it, I mean, to the point where they can't exist together and you can't get over it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the age is a real thing, too, because just, you know, you and I, as, as younger people, we have a lot of functional reserve in our body to be able to fight anything, really. I mean, we, we're, we're stronger, we're athletes, we're young, just in general. And so our body just naturally has more cells, more blood volume, um, able to sort of get to the different parts of our body the way it needs to. Our vessels aren't um, corroded with atherosclerotic plaque and things like that, where it gets hard to get to the it, the highway isn't clogged to get to the organs that we need to. But for these older people who've had 80 years or 90 years of having their arteries plaques um, and having them narrowed or don't have as many cells to get through or their blood's a lot thinner or their heart doesn't pump as fast or pump as strong as maybe ours is so it doesn't have that, that surge, that push to get out. I mean, all these things are just natural in the aging process. And so that's what makes it difficult too to get oxygen to the different parts of the body especially we're not getting it in with this virus. And that's why pneumonia knocks out people who are 85, 90 years old, and it doesn't knock out us. It looks like a little stumble. We keep moving. Right. Um, 
the natural process. So I want to talk about the doctors because I think um, people have said a lot about the doctors. People are applauding their efforts. Um, you know, they're they're thankful for people like you. But I also I also don't know that they really get the factors that go into decision making for some of these people on the front lines. Um, you know, I talked to a friend who says he has to consider not going home to his family. We have a nurse uh, in particular I can think of uh, who's got an immunocompromised uh, daughter at home. And so she's now working um, on a non-COVID-19 floor. Uh, and there's been some threats that that floor is going to turn into a COVID-19 patient floor. Mm-hmm. And she's, you know, making the hard decision to say, well, if this happens, I, I may have to step out of work for a while because I don't want to um, have my daughter be susceptible to this infection uh, if I get it and bring it to her. And so that's a real tough choice. She loves working. She's one of our best nurses. It'd be a value loss on our end not to have her around, uh, regardless if she's taking care of neurosurgical patients or COVID-19 patients. She's just spectacular, very bright, uh, and picks up a lot of things quickly. And she's got to make this tough choice. So we may lose a member like that. Um, our hospital is uh, guaranteeing some uh, hotels locally because the sure. the hours that our, our um, employees are working are really, really long. And if you live 45 minutes away, an hour away in New Hampshire, perhaps, or something like that, uh, they're guaranteeing some hot, some hotel rooms nearby so you don't have to go home and bring this infection to your family. So people are thinking about it for sure. When you come in, what are they, I mean, they have to like check you at the door and you know, probably you're changing clothes and in and out. What's going on when you when you walk in and when you leave? Yeah, so uh, there's an app that we use in our healthcare system. It's, it's this is Partners app that really goes through all the different symptoms that you may have. If you have no symptoms, you're cleared for work. If you do have a symptom, then you get triage and into a different area, and they kind of figure it out from there. Um, but you have to put on hand sanitizer and a mask, like I mentioned. So you're being checked and screened as you as you walk in. And then just a personal thing for, for myself and others, you know, we take off our scrubs before we get home just so we're not bringing it to our, right. um, you know, to our families and loved ones. I sent my wife down to, to Georgia, so she's away from me right now. So I'm not just exposing her. So all these different decisions, these personal decisions are, are being made. The antiviral um, medicine conversation, um, you know, there's been... Whether you like the way the information was disseminated or not, um, there's been talk about, you know, in, in particular, a drug that starts with H that I will butcher, hydrochloroquine. Yeah, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. Okay, so stuff like this. Okay, what's the biggest misconception? And that may well be the answer, but I, I know there's some people that think that in a crisis like this, the red tape is gone and that, you know, we're going to have a drug in a month. Like, And we're not even talking about vaccines right now. We're talking about, like, like, drugs um what what's the biggest misconception with this process for people as far as the 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 solutions we're going to have down the line including a vaccine but even before that is it because you want people to be healthy because you care about their health and their general well-being or is it because you want them to join the workforce again get the economy running and get the whole country back up again you know it's sort of where's the motivation coming from but me as a medical professional and as several others have said You cannot unleash a drug onto the market, into the world for consumption uh, widely without being tested, without it being safe. Uh, You do not want some sort of medication to harm a patient uh, worse than what it's trying to treat or what it's trying to prevent. And without finite, definitive, evidence-based, peer-reviewed, studied trials uh, that are sort of the gold standard, these randomized control trials, with good power and, and really, you know, good solid evidence, it's just, it's hard for me to, to get behind something that honestly may just be experimental at the time. Uh, yes, we're in a difficult situation. Yes, it's dire, but I, I honestly believe that with a flattening of the curve, everyone sort of buying in collectively to, you know, do their part, social distance and all that, I think you give the time for vaccinations and maybe for hydroxychloroquine uh, coupled with azithromycin, they're saying, you know, sort of uh, be tested and see if it, it can work. I, I just think it's really, really ambitious. And it honestly could be deleterious uh, to take it right now, just on a whim and just on, on a prayer and on a hope. Yeah, it just seems like the best medicine right now is to stay your ass home. I mean, like for me, I like, I got no problem doing it. I can speak for myself. I know that I have what I need. I'm very blessed. Like my family's, you know, healthy and 
and I have a job that I can work from home. I understand not everybody can do that. So I'm not minimizing that dilemma, but I think that if you can staying home is, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for the next wonder drug. It's going to take time. Uh, not only that, the vaccine's going to take a long time. Where are we right now? You mentioned flattening the curve. Um, you hear different things about that. You hear, you'll hear, oh, brace yourself. This is going to be the worst week. Uh, the timeline as you see it. And that's the thing. There's no, the virus sets the timeline. That's what I keep hearing on the news. And I would tend to agree there. Uh, but where are we in this battle as, as you look at it? Yeah. I, I mean, I see the last numbers that, you know, um, I was able to take a look at, uh, you know, we're still sort of going up a little bit actually in this country and the UK as well. Other places, France, South, South Korea, you know, they're starting to flatten a little bit as their numbers are going down. Um, Boston in particular, I can just speak for our, our city um, because we're getting constant updates from our mayor uh, and our hospital administration. Uh, we're going to see a surge next week and a week after potentially. Mid-April is supposed to be the real, real big time. Um, but I, I still think we have a ways to go. As far as the end game, the timeline, as you mentioned, the virus sort of determines that. And I've heard people whispering about you know, having NFL games and sporting events you know, around these times in a week or a month or you know, whatever the case may be. I just I just hesitate towards saying that that's the right move because, you know, you have so many people uh, that are infected. Um, there's people who are infected who don't know they're infected. Uh, you're in a very communal setting uh, when you're in a stadium, when you're in a locker room. Uh, you may just be reintroducing this bad bug, this bad virus to a group of people uh, who are just waiting to be infected based on the proximity they have to be to enjoy something that we all love. We want it back. We all do. There's no question. Yeah. Anyone's questioning whether we want to start the seasons up again or get back to the NCAA or those things, but you have to be very smart about it and be patient. We just have to prioritize for one year, dude. This is like our generation's test. Maybe just chill out for a year and just don't expect football. And if football comes, you know, as sports fans, which is very secondary, tertiary even, or I could go down the line. I don't have the vocabulary for it, but I mean, it's a thousand, you know, rungs down the ladder uh, to what we should be worrying about. But I, I'm with you. I, I would be surprised if, if the NFL starts on time. I also, you know, just uh, as somebody who doesn't know jack shit about any of this stuff, I'm looking at it and saying, why wouldn't there be a second surge? Like, why, when we get this thing under control, we're going to rush back out and expect to pack stadiums with 70,000 people. It doesn't seem realistic to me. That's correct. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that the best mode of sort of determining, and again, this could be from my own myopia being in a hospital, but the best mode of determining how well we're doing is when you see hospitals start opening up their floors uh, again, right? Our neurosurgical floor turns back into a neurosurgical floor. Mm -hmm. Our operating room started to pick up again. Our um, amount of ventilators we're using, amount of oxygen support that we're using, those things go down. The deaths go down. The infected people go down. When you use hospitals, and healthcare systems as a barometer, you say, okay, well, our most sick is sort of going down. The trend is going down and you want to see it consistently go down, not a blip here and then go up in a blip. No, you want to see it consistently go down, make it a trend. So, you know, at, at one point it's going to reach its, its bottom. And, um, and at that point, then you can consider getting back to this normal life. And that's, I think that's the way we got to go. Is this the best time that this could have happened in the, in, in, in the year? I mean, like, for this to happen in the summer, there is the possibility that, that the weather, you know, alters the trajectory of this, this curve or whatever. Um, you know, if it were the dead of winter, you're also dealing with like the start of flu season. Could it have been a lot worse in the fall? Um, and does the summer factor into it at all for you and what you're hearing in, in your line of work? So you hear some things that, well, it's not hitting the tropical countries as much. The Bahamas has, I think, 33 infected patients and six deaths. 80's got one or, or, or something very low. But the but testing I, capabilities and people could be dying in Haiti and we don't have, you know, like the medical infrastructure there just isn't very good. Absolutely. absolutely. You might not know, right? I mean, these are, these, these are aspects. The tests aren't widely available in some of these low to middle income countries. So uh, They're not widely available here and we got more money than, than God in the United States and we can't get our shit together and get people tested. When are we going to know, when are we going to have a testing uh, protocol that that's uh, that's sufficient in your eyes as you look at it. Yeah, I, I'm hoping soon. You know, I, I think that um, you know hospitals uh, are, are certainly being overtaxed and overwhelmed, and I I know that some Department of Health in different parts of the country, especially here in Massachusetts, I can speak for, 
uh, they've developed these like sort of drive-in clinics that sort of offloading the pressure from the hospital. But it needs to be more readily accessible. I think we obviously were behind. We're still playing a little bit catch up at this point, getting the tests available, getting the, the, the um, expediency of the test uh, so you get results quicker. Uh, and you're not waiting around for two or three days in a hospital, taking up a bed space if you don't need to. Um, and then also making sure that we're, we're not just solely relying on one test. If we need to do two tests to make sure we have an absolute true positive or a true negative and not a false positive or a false negative, right. make sure that we, we get that squared away too. And as the testing gets better, do you anticipate the mortality rate goes, uh, goes a little bit more in our favor because there's going to be more folks that we, we didn't know had it? And then, like, I forgot to ask you, you know, for the, for the flu truthers who think this is the flu, if they don't get it yet, um, how different is it from the flu? I mean, people cite mortality. People die of the flu every year. Uh, yeah, well, everybody has the flu. It's on such a larger scale. Um, can you help uh, maybe alleviate that intellectual burden that some people are suffering from? Yeah. First, the first question, I think test, uh, you know, more tests, the more people being tested, whenever you increase the power of a study, whenever you have more um, people in your study, uh, you can get more accurate numbers for sure. And so uh, you may see our mortality numbers go up. You may see the morbidity numbers go up um, just because we know more, more information. And that's, I think that's very helpful uh, sort of for epidemiologists sort of trend and track everything that's going on. As for the flu conversation, that's, I heard that in the beginning, that it's no worse than a flu. and uh, it's like a common cold, shouldn't worry about it. But frankly, I'm not being called to the emergency departments. I haven't seen in three years uh, of working there consistently as a neurosurgical resident where they're like, well, this patient has the flu, uh, but they also have a brain bleed. It's very serious and it does knock people out. It knocks those specific people out, as we were mentioning before. If you're already sick and you come in just appreciated on your immune system, yeah, it's certainly going to affect people in a, in, a, in a very bad way. But there's, this, no, there's no point. There's no point to, to equating the flu and COVID because one's a novel virus. Like it's you're, you're talking about to, like, what's the point of arguing that the flu and even if the, the rates change or lower a little bit, one is novel and one's not. We build up immunity to the flu, the flu for quite some time. I mean, I've been getting the flu since I was a kid. So um, I, it's, it's, it's crazy. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I do want to ask you in a second where you're getting your news from so people can go to the right place to get their news. Uh, but first I do want to ask you, what do you think, um, the new normal is pre pandemic or pre pre vaccine and post vaccine? How do you think this changes the way we, we do things in society? Do you have any, uh, inclinations of how that might change? Yeah, uh, you know, I think that the way we think about preventing something like this from happening again is um, making sure that if we hear, a, hear any sort of um, growing concern from another country or from maybe even a part of our own country, uh, that we develop quickly a systematic approach from hospital to the non-hospital sector of life uh, that manages this expeditiously. We've seen the countries that acted quickly and promptly sort of have a better response in, to in, in totality, right? So you see South yeah. Africa, for instance, uh, again, different economy, you know, different culture, all these things are different. However, it is still a, a very developed nation uh, that's got some wonderful technology and advancements that we have here in America, but they responded quickly, they had the right response, uh, and they activated a lot of their personnel in many aspects of their, of their life. So if we see this happen or, or have a glimpse that this will happen again. I think it needs to be a very quick response, a swift response, so that we're not playing catch up like we're playing right now. That's difficult to manage on any level, regardless of what kind of leader you are, what party you belong to. If you're behind, yeah. you're not going to make it. It's uh, you yeah, find people, you know, and I have my politics, whatever. We're not going down that road, but I, you find people that when you're critical of the government's response at this point, it's, it's, you're, you're politicizing a pandemic. No, we have to learn something from this. So the next one, if the Ebola virus had the transmittabil uh, transmittability of COVID, we would be all gone. Like, exactly. and that's the scary thing. This is like a, a love tap relative and I'm not trying to minimize it, but what, what it could be, it could be way worse. Not to mention people are dying. That's the primary, that's the primary issue here. So if you're if you're an economics major and you're worried about that, why don't we spend ahead of the next one and be ready? Absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
Agree more. <laughs> you guys, me know. Well, if you agree with me, then I'm, I'm feeling good about myself right now. Okay. Um, what? Where can people get news on this thing? Because there's a ton of. Before I let you go, I think that this has been incredibly informative. People, as this thing develops, are going to be going to their news sources, and um, if they don't like what they what they hear there, they might write it off. What? what where's the right place? Where do doctors read the news about this thing? So we actually read uh, articles, journal articles. That's where we go. And some of that language may be maybe a little bit difficult to digest. (laughs) But we go to Journal of American Medical Association. We go to New England Journal of Medicine. We go to these like scientific and scholastic articles because these are these are um, peer reviewed and data driven and non biased. Right? They're just like purely facts that you're getting. So if you can Google uh, journal articles, COVID-19, you know, you'll get some, some really factual articles that will be very helpful without a slant politically one way or the other. Yeah. And I mean, frankly, I think our hospital and other major hospitals, uh, Stanford, Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, you know, they have some wonderful resources on their websites. You actually go right to the source and you figure out, okay, you know, I like this article. I'm, I'm seeing what I'm seeing here. There's videos, there's tutorials. Our hospital's got a lot of that at Mass General. So uh, I think your hospitals, I think maybe your departments of health locally, uh, these journal articles, this is the best way that we go at it. Try to stay away from, you know, maybe some of the other networks that uh, may have a uh, politicized agenda, fortunately. Well, I got a great idea, a Rosetta Stone for uh, Doctor Speak that we could, you know, maybe we could, once this thing, uh, we could, you and I could get rich off this thing. We just take peer reviewed journals and, and translate them in layman's terms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so hit me up when this thing's over. Uh, Mark, can't thank you enough for your time. I know you're, you're getting ready to do a 24 hour shift. Uh, I speak for everybody listening when I say we, we, oh man, I appreciate you. And to think that you were once just a lowly NFL football player and now you're, you're a hero uh, saving lives and volunteering to walk onto that floor every night. I just, I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I'm, I'm appreciative you joined. No, thanks, man. It was uh, great catching up with you. Tell your brother and your dad, I said, hello, man. Uh, you're, you're awesome. Everything that I, I've seen you do, uh, you know, on, on Twitter, you're just uh, super, super well-respected and obviously got a great sense of humor too. I know you and George. You got support. to, you got to. Yeah, man. It's, it's amazing to watch. So thank you for having well, me. Thanks, bro. We got to get you on another time and, and stay safe and uh, my best to the family and kick some ass, dude. Thanks, brother.